Welcome to SSI Meetup. Today we have with us Robert Reed and Marcus Avadello, who will be reporting for us from the recent um, W3C DID working group that happened in Japan. This is the first DID working group session that took place after the approval of the DID working group, which happened very recently. And this is the first DID report. We will be doing more of these in the future. This is basically an idea that Drummond had and Marcus also said that he would be joining them. And I'm really happy about this because if you didn't have the opportunity to go to Japan, um, this is basically your opportunity to listen in to what was happening at the DID working group and how the future of decentralized identity with DIDs will be working with. Um, if you just cover quickly this next slide, um, I just will review with you the stuff we're doing here at SSI Meetup. Basically, what we're trying to do is to empower global SSI communities and this is open for everyone. It doesn't matter if you're a company, an individual, or community. Uh, no matter where you are and what you do, you can use this material with the Creative Commons by Share Alike license, which basically mean, means you can reuse the material in whatever way you want around the world. Just please give credit back to the authors today. And you will see in the slides that there are multiple people that have contributed to the slide set. Um, Marcus and Drummond will be presenting all of them. But there's also, there are also slides from Manus Borny, um, um, Ken Ebert, and, and Joe Andrew. And, and also from Daniel Buckner. So plenty of people, um, all the key people participating in the DID working group that presented in Japan. And yeah, um, it's really a pleasure and a privilege to have this opportunity of having Drummond and, and Marcus presenting this because if not, it's really difficult to have access to this. So it's, that's really nice. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, um, please let me know. Um, you can use the question tool and I'll share those questions with um, Drummond and Marcus. If not, we can just cover them at the end. I mean, you'll see there are plenty of slides and plenty of material. We'll cut, try to cover some of them in separate sessions too, in more detail, but at least you will get a very highlight overview of this whole thing. And um, Drummond will be driving this session. Drummond has been traveling like crazy around the world. I think Japan, I think he's in London right now. Then he goes to IRW. Marcus seems to be in Korea right now. So they're non-stop travelers and still made time and, and, and joining. And now that I think about it, I think that for Marcus actually is pretty, pretty late right now. So thank you for that too. Um, yeah, welcome to both of you, um, Drummond and Marcus. Thank you so much for making time. Uh, thank you very much, Alex. It's always a pleasure to do this. And uh, it's it's actually uh, pretty reasonable for me. Uh, it's it's uh, currently uh, 8 p.m. In, in London time. I don't know what time it is for Marcus, because uh, even though I, I came to London after the meeting in, in uh, Fukuoka, Japan, uh, Marcus, I think, has done two more cities already. Marcus, where, where are you now? What time is it for you? Yeah, I'm in Korea, and it's 4 a.m., but that, that's okay, then. so I, I just got there, and uh, I, I don't really know what time it is anyway <laughs> yes i know you have uh you've i think done you know, that's your second city after uh, uh fukuoka so uh well excellent um we wanted to take this opportunity because uh it really it was um i, I think quite a milestone in the evolution of the ssi space for us to finally have the the first meeting of the new uh official uh, w3c did uh working group and uh, and and as Alex emphasized, we Marcus and I really are just uh, we're, we're uh, two reporters here for you. Um, there were, I think, a good, um, uh, I think, almost 40 folks that uh, attended the meeting, um, uh, working group participants and uh, observers, and we had several meetings with others, uh, other W3C working groups that we'll we'll tell you about. So it was a, a very all immersive uh, week. Um, what we have up right now is just a little bit of background for folks that uh, may not be familiar. We'll tell you more. Um, um, I, uh, uh, I love SSI Meetup and, and uh, uh, have been done a number of these uh, largely because I spent so much time working on internet identity. I'm really excited that we're, we're getting to this uh, really watershed that's happening there. Um, the DID uh, uh, SPAC uh, and the whole evolution of, of the uh, infrastructure based on it, I'm, I'm very deeply invested in and really worked on it from the outset for the last four years. There's a, a slide that will talk more about that. Um, at Evernim, I'm the Chief Trust Officer and at the Sovereign Foundation, uh, I'm one of the uh, founding trustees and I chair the governance working group. 
Uh, Marcus, uh, you've, you've been uh, almost as long in internet identity. Do you want to just cover your background here for just a little bit? Uh, sure, I can. I can do that. Yeah, like like you said, I've also worked on identity technologies for for a really long time, more than more than ten years since the early days of of OpenID and, and other uh, first generation user centric identity uh, protocols. I've I've also uh, contributed to the did work from pretty much from the beginning since the uh, first few rebooting Web of Trust workshops and Internet Identity Workshop where this, where this work uh, has been happening. And uh, I'm also very, very excited to have this uh, next step now with the uh, Deed Working Group starting at WS3C. Feels like an important milestone. And indeed, your your business uh, uh, based in Vienna, Danube Tech, uh, has, has grown quite a bit around this work and the interest in uh, DIDs and verifiable credentials and SSI as well. So uh, uh, congrats on that. You were telling me about a number of the new um, uh, uh, grants in, in, in that you are uh, ha have won here recently. So uh, uh, I think it's, it's a testament to how this space is growing. All right, yeah. let's go ahead. Sure. Well, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, then then you tech where it was still a, a very small startup, uh, three people, but but indeed we do work on on, on big stuff or do some implementation and consulting work. And like many others in this space, I, I think we well, we also feel how interest is in, in this, uh, these technologies is just uh, growing more and more all the time. Yeah, it is. It is. I mean, again, that's. That's what SSI Meetup is chronicling, and that's why uh, I was suggesting as we as we start the uh, uh, the did working group that this was uh, uh, a regular series we should have, and and we're going to frame it of, of why the t next two years are going to be uh, uh, a series of milestones for this area. So uh, the story starts, and we'll just give a, a quick overview. Um, I worked on DISBN uh, four years ago, and uh, first. First draft spec, um, and we'll cover the timeline in more detail here, uh, started to gain real momentum. It was contributed to the World Wide uh, Web uh, 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 Consortium, uh, what's called the Credential Community Group, uh, about two and a half, almost three years ago. And, uh, and that spec then uh, continued to develop there and finally uh, was ready for what's called a full W3C working group. That's the only kind of uh, group at W3C that can produce a full W3C standard. That was approved by the membership uh, in the, uh, I think the first day of September or the first working day, uh, that vote was completed and that paved the way for the first meeting of that working group at W3C's annual conference called uh, TPAC, uh, Technical Plenary and Advisory uh, Committee Conference, which uh, this year was in uh, Fukuoka, Japan. It uh, rotates between the three major continents every uh, year. Um, so, so that's why we were all in Japan for this. And uh, I must say it was fabulous. Uh, it was wonderfully hosted at the uh, Fukuoka. Uh, at the Fukuoka Hilton there. Alex, just checking in, it just uh, gave us a, 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 a notice that we're broadcasting now. Were we not before? Just just checking on that. Um, um, sorry, I made a little mistake. I, I started recording, but I didn't release it to, to everyone else. So the, the people just oh. start now. Uh, yeah. If you want okay. to go back maybe quickly and do a quick review of that, then we make sure that everyone who's listening right in right now can just quickly check that. Okay. Do you want me to go back to the first slide or just just the start of this? Slide? Um, did, your your slide. Yeah, maybe your slide. Um, this slide is good because this is the first one. Sure. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, for folks who are joining now, uh, this is uh, uh, Marks and I are going to cover. Uh, this is just a quick. Uh, here, I'll just go right here. Where does the story start? <clears throat> well, it starts with um, um, 
work I did starting four years ago and, and, and the first draft spec gaining some real momentum, it was then contributed to W3C uh, Community Working Group, uh, where it was further incubated for the last two and a half years. And then uh, that resulted in a the vote to become a full working group, which is the only W3C uh, uh, group that can create a, a full W3C standard. And that uh, was approved at the end of August, and um, that paved the way for the first meeting at their annual conference called TPAC in, uh, that this year was in Fukuoka, Japan. So what Marcus and I are going to do here is we're going to cover <coughs> the highlights uh, and we're going to, uh, of that uh, working group meeting, which is Monday and Tuesday, the first two days of the conference. And then uh, Wednesday is what they call the plenary day or, or essentially open space sessions. There are 60 different sessions, uh, 12 rooms or over five hours for uh, different groups to present and meet with each other and um, and share information. So we had two sessions on DIDs, one talking about the non-technical overview and, and, and how, to, how to communicate about DIDs with a very wide audience that's really interested in them. And then, uh, and then another one, which was a, a, a deeper technical Q&A. So we're gonna share slides from you from both the working group meeting and uh, those, two, uh, those two sessions. And we're going to divide them into some major sections here. We're going to start out with some background uh, material that uh, some of which I uh, I gave in the first uh, you know, the start of the working group just to make sure everyone was uh, was uh, grounded. And again, we had uh, over 40 folks attend the working group uh, uh, directly. Uh, there are actually 53 members of the working group now from 18 different companies, not all of which have been part of the work on DIDS before. So that's why we shared this background info. So let's start right into it. Uh, we we actually uh, wanted to put forth and say, what what is a DID, a decentralized identifier? So um, we offered up this this you know, very, very quick uh, summary that it did is a, a new type of global unique identifier. Technically, it is a URI, the standard identifier of the World Wide Web. It, 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 um, but what's unique about it is it does not require a centralized registration authority. It's not, not based on a DNS name or an IP address. And the reason is it's because control of these identifiers can be proved using cryptography. Um, so they're fundamentally based in cryptography, and that's the tie-in to uh, blockchains and distributed ledgers, as we'll cover in some more depth. Um, so um, uh, we'll just we'll we'll keep going through this to uh, uh, get much deeper about that. Now we provide a little bit of historical perspective. So where did the term DID come from? Uh, this question comes up every so often because it's it's not you know it's not not a uh, term you, you you hear very often until uh, you know until it was hatched at the W3C and in fact that is where it came from. Um, there was a uh, prior to the emergence of verifiable credentials as a working group, which is uh, actually just completed its two-year charter and soon that will be a full W3C uh, 1.0 standard. Um, that was started out of uh, what was called the Verifiable Claims Task Force. And that group, uh, the date you're seeing here is April 2018, but actually the work started almost two years before that. They produced a, um, a draft report called a Decentralized Hash Table for the Web. And Manny Sporny, Dave Longley, uh, the CEO and CTO of Digital Bazaar, respectively, were the uh, uh, primary contributors to this, uh, authors and editors. And in that document, they introduced the term DID. We actually have it on the next slide here. From the terminology section, uh, they, they, they had come up with this term decentralized identifier, or DID, and a uh, decentralized identifier document, now called a DID document. Now, the definitions you see on the screen here um, were, were their uh, concept of what a did would be, uh, they're they're no longer uh, completely accurate. They're you know very very generally true, but uh, but we have gone a long ways down the road from that very initial concept that they had come up with. And this is where I first encountered it when uh, uh, when we were starting uh, down the road to say, hey, we need this new type of identifier. Now, the next slide is going to help uh, uh, really you know cover in how how 
much work has gone on on DIDs over the next uh, over the last uh, four years, uh, and so we we created this timeline, and we're going to step through it quickly to see get a sense of just how much uh, has led up to this point. So the work on DIDs actually began in 2015 uh, with the very first discussions of what what we were then calling blockchain identity, using identity to solve uh, using blockchain and, and uh, distributed ledger technology to solve key problems in, in, in the space of internet identity. IW on this slide, that stands for Internet Identity Workshop. You've heard that covered a number of times here on uh, SSI Meetup. The next one is actually in two weeks uh, in Mountain View, California, and we will have another uh, SSI Meetup uh, uh, webinar uh, wrap up on IW after the next one. So <coughs> that's where we first began discussing it. And it was actually shortly after that that the uh, the document I just mentioned was first uh, published um, in the uh, Verifiable Claims Task Force at W3C. So um, after that spring IW, we formed uh, an informal uh, a working group uh, to, to work on, so how would we leverage blockchain and distributed ledger? And we, we talked for, we met for, you know, about, every couple of weeks for uh, six months. And at that fall, IAW happens twice a year. We uh, had, had a number of sessions on um, blockchain-based identity of what we now call decentralized or self-sovereign identity. And we really decided, let's get going. Let's start actually figuring out how to engineer this. And um, that's really where I, where, where I started uh, getting very involved. I know Marcus uh, was there. and. He too wanted to dive into this new way to solve the problem. So, uh, meanwhile, also attending that IW was uh, a uh, fabulous gentleman named Adil, Anil John, who uh, had recently started as the head of privacy and, and, and data, uh, um, excuse me, identity and data privacy at the Department of Homeland Security, uh, a, a U.S. government department. And he decided there was enough promise there that he would uh, uh, start sponsoring some. Uh, uh, research grants in that, and he put out a research grant to deal with how do you do blockchain identity and with adequate privacy. And uh, several of us who were at uh, uh, in the space applied for that, and the first contracts were awarded. And one of them, uh, from the company I was uh, uh, heading at the time, Respect Network, was to propose a new form of identifier uh, to do that. And, and that's, we called that a DID based on uh, what you saw in that document uh, earlier. And when we got that contract in March of that year, that's when we officially began work on it. In fact, we began work uh, across the community, both at IW and a new conference that had just started called Rebooting Web of Trust. That's what RWOT stands for. And uh, and the and the first big uh, um, uh, rebooting web of trust, uh, or the, s the second version of those, the first one we spent a lot of time in that spec was uh, in New York, the day after the first uh, ID 2020 meeting at the United Nations. So uh, and we gave ourselves six months to do that. Sure enough, we 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 got it done in that six month period before the next. Uh, IW and Rebooting Web of Trust that fall. They both take place uh, pretty much every six months now, just usually about a month apart. <laughs> and uh, we actually then uh, completed and, and turned that in to, uh, uh, you know, finish that contract and published that spec um, uh, publicly uh, by the end of, of 2016. And that led to the next step, which was um, going, uh, uh, once you finish a, a first level, what they call uh, a small business innovation research grant, you can get a larger one. And we proposed one to do the key management for decentralized identifiers. If you have, if the, if the identifiers are decentralized and based on uh, uh, public-private key pairs, then the key management also needs to be decentralized. And DKMS stands for Decentralized Key Management System, and we got a contract uh, to start designing that, which uh, uh, went forward. And one of the things we did is we uh, said, okay, the spec now for DIDs needs to uh, uh, continue to mature. So it was contributed to uh, a community group at the W3C called the Credentials Community Group. That's what CCG stands for, where it can now uh, start to incubate with a larger group. Uh, I don't I don't know exactly. I think there's a good 
100 plus people that are part of the credentials community group at the W3C. By the way, anyone can join that group. It does not require to be a W3C member. There's no cost involved. You just have to make a, uh, uh, an IPR commitment that you're going to work on free and open standards. <clears throat> and, uh, and that group is still very active today, as, as you'll see here. So uh, highly recommend folks listening to this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, please do come and join us. So uh, work went on quite intensively uh, on the whole area of DIDS and DKMS over the next uh, year. Um, the first public version of DKMS design and architecture was published at uh, the Hyperledger Indie project at Hyperledger in uh, March of 2018. And uh, that coincided with, uh, we made some improvements in maturity and we uh, uh, reached what I call the second draft of DID spec at the uh, W3C Coordinators Community Group. Then uh, we said, okay, we believe this is now getting ready for full standardization. So we began work later that year on the charter that we needed to start a full W3C working group. That's what you have to do before you can do that. You have to have a charter that will then go to a vote. And uh, the next step after that is we um, completed our DKMS contract, published uh, version four at, um, uh, also again at Hyperledger. And uh, if, you, if you're looking for that, the easy thing to do is just uh, 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 Google uh, decentralized key management system um, or add V4 if you wanna make sure you're getting there and uh, you can, you can uh, uh, read that document. And then that led to the very final step. I've got to move this here to make sure I can see the slide. Of um, we uh, finished what we call the community final draft of the did spec to prepare to contribute it to the working group because the working group, again, the charter was approved at the end of September and that, uh, I mean, at end of August, and that uh, um, laid the way for the working group meeting that happened in Fukuyo. Fukuoka. So I'm going to stop there for a second and say, Marcus, uh, any, any, any thoughts about, uh, you know, that four-year gestation period before we got to a, uh, a full working group? Uh, no, that, that, that's a very good summary. Sometimes when uh, looking at this and when thinking about the last few years, I, I, I wonder, um, how much have we done already and, and how much is uh, still ahead of us, right? I'm, I'm not sure. Some, sometimes it feels like we've uh, spent so much time on this already and we we are close to done. It's, it's just a matter of now uh, going through the process. But on the other hand, I, I suspect that there will uh, still be uh, quite a few uh, challenges or still quite some work uh, ahead of us. It's a great point, and uh, I think we all wonder that. Uh, we will cover, you know, the what's ahead of us in terms of the working group schedule uh, shortly. Um, and uh, but but one thing I think we can agree on because we discussed it in uh, Fukuoka, which is uh, it's it's a little unusual for a new um, W3C working group to have a specification coming in that's that's quite as mature or far along in terms of uh, of the market. SDIDs. It, it does happen at times, but this is uh, being incubated at a community group. They were, there were folks that were new to it. Were like, "Wow, you guys really are quite a ways along." And so let's let's actually, uh, uh, as part of the background, we wanted to make sure new newcomers to uh, the working group were aware. Well, where where are DIDs in the market? And here's a few stats. Just uh, uh, if you're a regular listener to the SSI Meetup, you may be aware of these, but let's just uh, share a couple. Right now, there are currently, uh, in, in an informal registry maintained by the CCG, there are 32 DID methods that have been registered. And in order to have one registered, you must have written a specification, uh, what's called a DID method specification. And, uh, and then, in most cases, there are implementations of those specifications. So, so this is not, you know, you know it's, it's, it's not like there aren't quite a few folks out there already working with DIDs. Um, here's the uh, URL for that registry. And just to note, uh, because DIDs can be written for any form of what we call a, a DID network, uh, not just uh, distributed ledgers, 
But for distributed ledgers, there are three did methods written for Bitcoin. There are six different ones in that registry, registry for Ethereum. Uh, so uh, it's, it's pretty rich. Um, we mentioned the Sovereign Foundation earlier that I'm a trustee of and Marcus on the Technical Governance Board. Uh, that's a public permission ledger. And there are 71 stewards that have been approved for that. So um, there's uh, there and those are large and small uh, organizations all around the world that are that are uh, uh, contributing, uh, running a node of that ledger. So that's and that ledger is really primarily for for dids and what else is necessary for SSI. So that's another uh, metric. And then we've talked before about how uh, the Canadian province of British Columbia and Ontario have already issued almost a million and a half um, verifiable business license credentials based on DIDs. So there's some serious usage out there. There's many more things as you listen to SSI Meetup. Uh, you'll hear many more stories about how these things are starting to come out. All right, well, let's dive down into this next section covers background material and, and or you know, really understanding dids that we shared with everyone in the working group to make sure we're on the same page. And we, I, I know it was very helpful there. So we're just gonna dive into it here. Alex, I'm just gonna check at each one of these uh, um, section markers if there are any questions that are pending. Cool, I'll, I'll let you know if there's, if there's any. Okay, very good. All right, well, let's just dive down into this. Um, so one of the questions you might have already as well, so why was, uh, you know, DHS, uh, you know, why did that? Why did they get into? What was it about the IDs that um, that said, "Hey, let's let's go ahead and create a specification for this"? And uh, we spent a long time talking about these four core properties of a DID, and I want to drill through each one. First of all, they are persistent identifiers. Uh, that's what we call them in the identifier space, um, or permanence. Another, and, and what that means is, once you assign one. There's no administrative authority that can turn around and, and set, reassign it or, or cancel it. Meaning if you register a domain name, for instance, if you stop paying for that domain name, it can get you know, uh, reassigned to someone else. Uh, your phone number is, uh, even if you have phone number portability, if you stop using that phone number, they can take it and reassign it to someone else. Uh, IP addresses on the, on the web, you know, on the internet today, um, uh, if you have dynamic IP, you have a different IP address every time you connect to the to the uh, network. Um, and certainly, almost all the addresses in the world um, that we use, you know, uh, as people, are not persistent. Um, they are very. Uh, and for security purposes, it's very important that if you're going to have an address that folks are going to rely on for for a, a strong, secure connection, it needs to not change. And that's the first thing after it did. Now, the second one is DIDs are also resolvable. And what that means, you can look at, you can use it to look up and discover metadata uh, describing the entity um, identified by the DID. And that's, that's the whole reason that uh, DID infrastructure can be used for the next thing, which is cryptographically uh, verifiability. As we said earlier, DIDs, are identifiers for which you can prove control using cryptography. And in fact, that is what uh, the key to why they are decentralized. They do not require centralized registration authorities because those cryptographic keys can be uh, anywhere on your local devices, um, and, you know, on, on servers you control, wherever you might keep those keys, you can maintain control of that identifier. And that's how they're decentralized. So what's unique about DIDs is, to our knowledge, and we checked again we, uh, throughout the conference at W3C, we, we went over these four points and uh, with some very, very experienced people in, in internet infrastructure and, and uh, identity, and they agreed. They do not know of an identifier, a class of identifiers um, that have all four of these properties. There are a number that have three of them, and <laughs> those are the closest thing to DIDs, but this is the only thing with all four. Um, Marcus, uh, any any comments on these four essential qualities of a did? I I, I think you're right. Yeah, it feels like a new type of identifier, and and uh, 
going to the W3C meeting, it was uh, a special feeling to you know to see how this working group is is uh, is beginning its its work and uh, getting this this, sort of this uh, official recognition in a way from from W3C. So what we're what we're talking about here by standardizing this new type of identifier with all those four properties is is really potentially uh, working on a new evolutionary era of of the web itself, right? It, it feels like uh, something that's very much in line with the original vision of the web, uh, adding a new new building block uh, to the to the web uh, with identifiers that have that have these these properties and uh, with the uh, resolution and some, some other things that uh, you're going to, to talk about is uh, really something that, that has the potential, I think, to change a lot and to change the protocols and also just the way how the how the web works, precisely because those features have, have not been uh, available in, in, in a single identifier so far. I think there's this, this quote, right, by, by Tim Berners-Lee who said, uh, DNS is the Achilles heel of the of the web, and and I think at the decentralized web summit at some point he he mentioned in a, in a conversation that if this had been available when he invented the web, then he would have uh, used something like this as, rather than rather than DNS. So because because of those properties, I, I think we can we can say this, this is really something um, that uh, that's going to change the web, and that hasn't been available so far. I right, perfectly put. Um, I think we acknowledged and had good discussions about the fact that that DIDs really are a building block of the, uh, uh, you know, the next generation of the web. Uh, the next, you know, whole, the whole uh, what I some, sometimes call the the cryptographic, um, uh, cryptographically verifiable web. Uh, it's also called you know the web of trust and the web of value and many other things. Uh, but it is. Um, I think really becoming apparent to folks at W3C that there's this whole dimension of uh, uh, cryptographically verifiable web, and and this is a core building block for that. So um, we're talking about this in the abstract. Uh, it helps everyone to actually see, well, so what do these things look like? What is this? Uh, and uh, this slide will show you, I think I've, I've, I've shared it on SSI Meetup before, but I want to make sure it's clear. Um, the pattern for DIDs um, is actually established by um, uh, an existing form of identifier, the, the standard for persistent identifiers, uh, ironically called UR, URNs, Uniform Resource Names. Names are usually, usually not the thing we think of as persistent, but that's the name of this uh, type of identifier in web architecture. And it's RFC 8141 is the latest, and you can see that it consists of basically three parts, the scheme that all uh, URIs, uniform resource identifiers, start with the part before the colon. Usually, you see HTTP, HTTPS, um, other things like you know mail to or FTP. Uh, in this case, for URNs, it's 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 URN. And what follows that before the next colon is called the URN namespace, and that's how you get all these different types of URNs. The example we're showing here is UUID. And I chose that because it's an example of a decentralized, an identifier that's not require centralized identif uh, uh, authority to register. UIDs are generated algorithmically um, based on random numbers. And uh, there's very, very high, they're 128 bits long. So you, that's why you see this long string that follows that. Um, uh, this defined by the UID spec. And um, they're, they're very high probability to be globally unique. Um, the chance of collision of two uh, UIDs is, is infinitesimally small. So anyway, this basic three-part structure, we said, hey, uh, and I credit Christopher Allen with the insight that we could use that same thing for DIDs. Um, and uh, so you, you see this same three parts. The scheme is DID. But what follows that is what we call the did method, and we're going to talk about those more. It does form a namespace for what we call then the method specific string, um, but uh, but it's 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 much broader. And each did method will define the structure and the and the requirements for its method specific string, including it can contain additional colons. You can uh, essentially nest your namespace or, or or divide your namespace if you choose to. 
So, so that's, uh, again, the example uh, method is actually called out uh, in, in the spec as, as it'll be reserved for examples, uh, but we'll show you some other examples as we go through this. Now, did methods are critical. Go ahead, you're gonna say something. Yeah, sure. j just a quick question here for Michael. I think we're just good maybe to bring it up now. It's related to the previous slide in a way. And, and, and he's saying, isn't it too late? Uh, is, is it too late to dump DNS? Right, or, or are we still on time? Oh, uh, based, I, I understand based on the ideas, like if, if we have the ideas now, maybe you can, we can drop DNS or will, do you think it will be something that will be going hand in hand, like DNS yeah. will just keep on existing as it is and identity will be going with the ideas? Well, it's, uh, first of all, DIDs are not meant to replace DNS. It's an alternative identifier. Marcus, uh, it's, it's true that Tim Berners-Lee, uh, as he understood the full implications, uh, felt this would have been a better uh, choice had they existed then. But I would argue, actually, that they solve different types of problems. And uh, DNS has, you know, it's a critical part of uh, internet and web infrastructure today uh, is not going away anytime soon. And I would argue that DNS names, they just solve a different kind of problem than DID. So I think the two will coexist for a very long time, uh, at least as long as I plan to continue to work on this. Um, Marcus, do you have any other perspective on that? No, I, I agree. Of, of, of course, I didn't, didn't want to uh, suggest that that could happen anytime soon because like you say they they fulfill uh, different purposes they have different properties if we if we consider a sucos triangle right and uh, domain names are human memorable you can write them down and remember them you cannot do that with with did so i i think what what we could see is is this really enhancing and strengthening the structure of the web um, but not not to replace DNS because they each have their strengths and weaknesses, and there's there's actually quite some work happening also in in various communities and on how those can be combined uh, or how you can uh, associate a deed with a, with a domain name uh, to get the best of from both worlds. Yeah, I I strongly agree. In fact, uh, for many folks that are familiar with with you know internet and web infrastructure and plumbing. I try to point out DIDs uh, are an evolutionary progression uh, that closer to IP addresses than they are to domain names. As you can see here, you know most people don't consider IP addresses to be something they're not they're not memorable, um, and they're and they're largely you know t uh, used behind the scenes, um, and, and you don't typically see IP addresses, uh, and, and users don't interact with them directly. The same will be true of DIDs. Um, uh, I, I literally. I'm not even sure there's any software out there other than, you know, uh, tools made for developers that actually expose the DIDs. Um, uh, they, they, they expose the functionality based on top of them. <clears throat> so um, I agree with Marcus, we could have a whole other webinar on the, the ways that now um, you, you, you can uh, layer uh, semantic naming on top of DIDs just like uh, DNS is layered over IP addresses. All right, well, moving along here. Uh, so did methods are critical to DIDs. This is something that is different than uh, URNs or, or other identifiers that we're familiar with. So what a did method is, it, it defines not just the structure of a did, but how to perform the four CRUD operations. And those are, how do you create a did? How do you read it uh, or resolve it? We'll talk more about that in a minute. How do you update it if you want to rotate your public keys or change the service endpoints associated with it? And then lastly, how do you uh, deactivate it? Usually in CRUD, did is, uh, the D is delete, but a did is persistent. So you don't delete it. You just basically turn it off and say this did is no longer uh, active. Uh, and and uh, so you should stop using it or relying on it. So all of these must be defined by a did method specification. So if you want to create a new type of did, um, then you have to write a spec that does these four things. <laughs> and um, those four things that, that the the uh, the thing you're going to uh, create and read and update and then eventually deactivate is called a did document. And a did document 
is um, the it's uh, a, a data structure that the did points to, and it contains this metadata describing the uh, entity identified by the did, which we call the did subject. And uh, did documents typically you don't that there are are variants, but in most cases, what the key thing they contain is the public keys or the cryptographic proof material. That's that's what makes uh, DIDs cryptographically verifiable. They many times will also contain what's called service endpoint. Uh, it's a location on the in, uh, on the uh, on the network um, for for interacting with. If you have a did for a person, then it's a way to interact with a person. If it's for an organization, to do the same thing. But dids also can represent things. So anything on the Internet of Things that has a DID um, can can turn around. You can resolve that DID, look up this did document, and find out how to interact with it. Um, a third thing is they also have authentication mechanisms. How do you, how can you prove control of a did depending on the different ways you might interact uh, with another party? And they're extensible to include other metadata. And, uh, and this whole process uh, of going from a did to did document, and here is an example of what we were just talking about here. Um, and this is the JSON LD form, which is the standard form currently in the spec. Um, other, uh, serializations, other other um, um, uh, formats of a DID document are now being dis discussed by the DID uh, working group. Um, uh, XML is a, a. Go ahead. Just, I mean, because Michael he's also asking, and I think it's a good thing to to mention that. Asking, uh, what, what is an end? Maybe you can briefly also mention that. Yeah, I wanted to uh, to get to this example because it's a little bit easier to see. And, they, and this is a very simplified example. There, it it can be richer here. But what you see here in this did document, you see the uh, this is a JSON LD document. That's the first thing. The context. The ID is the DID here. This is just an ex a short example DID. And what you're seeing is here is an example of a public key, a service, uh, what we call a service endpoint here, and authentication. The service endpoint will tell you that the important thing is. What type of service are you, uh, uh, you know, is is available to interact with this entity, and where is it? Um, that's what we call the service endpoint, and that service endpoint is um, a uh, a URL in this case for how to go uh, and interact with this particular um, uh, entity, and it's an HTTPS URL. This is an example of how you could go talk to a cloud service that, uh, in this case, is the type is a hub. That's something being defined uh, well, in several places, but the Decentralized Identity Foundation is working on the definition of a, of a hub service for how you can interact and exchange data with an entity identified by a DID. <clears throat> so that's the basic idea of what a service uh, and a service endpoint, the URL associated with it. Uh, a, a, a DID document can have as many uh, public keys as um, the, uh, the the did author wishes to publish. It can have multiple services associated with also multiple types of authentication. But all these are actually optional, so you don't have to have any of these in the did document. Um, any other questions, Alex, about uh, this? Yeah, and what Michael is just asking just right now, he's also asking what is a hub? Is it a data store versus a credential or other digital identity? Yeah, a hub is a is a, a store of data associated with a digital identity. Um, uh, whether it will store um, credentials associated with it is is still being uh, debated. But the term is generally a, a, a data store associated uh, and, and uh, with the uh, the entity identified by the DID and usually controlled by that entity. Um, it's different than a digital wallet, um, which is specifically about uh, storing uh, keys and other cryptographic material used by that entity. Um, but Maybe. go ahead. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm not directly related to that, but his previous question I think was also related to the point. Like an endpoint is an endpoint only a URL, or can it be something else too? Um, in theory, it could be something else, but the specification uh, definition of a uh, service is that uh, it is a collection of URLs. Um, now, those URLs, of course, could be any, it's technically a URI, a uniform resource identifier. So whatever um, address you could provide in the URI, uh, doesn't have to be HTTP or HTTPS, um, is, uh, is, you could describe it as a service. 
All right. So um, the process of going from a DID to uh, um, uh, a DID document is what was called DID resolution. And this is uh, uh, Marcus's uh, specialty um, because DID resolution, uh, as we'll cover, is it, it depends how you do this, how you how you how you read the DID. You go from the DID to the DID document depends on the DID method, and there are a number of ways to, to do it. In your specification, you define the, the read operation as how you do it, and um, the variety has actually been quite surprising to us that, uh, you know, uh, worked on the original spec, the number of diff different DID methods. Um, how you will, the, the overall generic definition of DID resolution and the vocabulary and uh, um, called the meta protocol um, is going to be defined in a separate specification. That's not actually in scope for the current DID uh, working group. Uh, there's some discussion that it may be uh, uh, something that we decide to uh, add once we're far enough along. Um, Marcus is uh, uh, one of the editors of the, this is already a spec underway at the credentials community group. Uh, it's been going in parallel with the DID spec for, for uh, quite some time. Uh, Marcus, do you want to say a little bit about uh, the did, re did resolution spec? Yeah, sure. So, so like you said, that's that's uh, still happening in the credentials community group, uh, not not in the in the working group. It's an it's one of the work items with, within the credentials community group, um, and uh, we've had separate uh, calls for a while. Uh, Dimitri, Zachdelin, and and myself, and uh, several others have been. Uh, contributing and, and working on on the resolution, as you said, it's uh, basically the process of invoking the read method of the uh, applicable did method uh, to get from the did to the did document. I I think did resolution is really getting more and more attention right now because it's it, it's useful to define a new type of identifier. But I, at some point you want to you want to use it for something, right? You want to use it for uh, service discovery, as you as you've explained, you want to uh, use it for uh, for authenticating, for logging in, uh, did off uh, flows. You want to use it for uh, verifiable credentials, for validating proofs, and uh, and so on. Now, in in theory, if we if we consider a uh, web architecture and URI architecture, in, in theory, uh, you're supposed to uh, separate identification from interaction, right? So there, there may be some use cases where uh, these are useful without the resolution. They are, they are valid URIs. You can uh, construct uh, data data around it. You can uh, construct an RDF graph, a JSON-LD document to make to identify things, talk about things, to, to express data related to the subjects that are identified by dates. Uh, those are things you can do uh, without Gate resolution, but uh, most of the applications in SSI and decentralized identity uh, require the, the resolution part as as well in order to uh, to find ways how uh, how we can interact with the subject that's that's identified by the by the date. But for now, the the working group, as you said, for now it's out of scope for the working group. Uh, the approach is, is similar as as it was with the verifiable claims working group, which also just defined the uh, the data model, but not a not a protocol. Uh, so so for now, I think it will uh, continue like this, where a working group will define a syntax and data model for it, and at the same time, the community group will uh, work on data resolution. But those things are are obviously uh, closely related and. Um, yeah, there are lots of things we could uh, talk about related to deed resolution. I'll just I'll just say say one thing, uh, which is deed resolution can be very diverse because deed methods are very diverse, right? There's not uh, there's not one single deed resolution protocol. It's not a client server protocol uh, like HTTP or or DNS lookups, but it's more like an, uh, an abstract function or a or a concept getting from the D to the D document and uh, initially we had we had ledger based deeds but uh, where deeds are registered on blockchains but by now there as you said there are many more deed methods that are much more diverse and and creative uh, on how exactly 
updates can be uh, can be created and, and resolved. Yeah, and we're going to cover some of those uh, towards the, the 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 latter part of this. Um, and just uh, if you are particularly interested in did resolution. Uh, again, the credentials community group is where those uh, that work will continue. Uh, Marcus hosts a call once a week. Uh, it has been on Thursdays. I think it will uh, probably continue, uh, but uh, uh, easy to find out uh, through the credentials community group. Um, and we, we have this uh, note here. Uh, Marcus actually prepared this slide to make it uh, uh, clear. So the did spec is now the the province that did working group, uh, which I think is going to end up meeting on Tuesday uh, mornings, uh, or I say mornings, mornings in the U.S. Uh, but uh, Tuesdays, the resolution spec, as we just explained, is going to continue uh, in the credentials community group, and we'll also have a weekly call. And then did method specs, anyone can write one and create it wherever you want. Uh, you don't need to go to a standards body. And you can define it, implement it, and uh, if you if you do want others to know about it, you can go uh, and register at the uh, informal registry that is currently maintained by the credentials community group. Uh, and there'll probably be uh, more about that coming out as we finish the uh, the did spec. But that's that's the relationship of all those things. So uh, our next set, we're going to answer qu some basic questions about the did working group. Do we have uh, any other questions queued up, Alex, or should we keep going? We can keep on going. All right. Now, this we just want to make sure folks are wondering. Well, what is this new working group? Uh, first of all, who who did sign up to be uh, uh, part of it? Uh, so the chairs uh, are uh, two uh, uh, outstanding gentlemen. We all agreed they did a great job on the first uh, uh, set of meetings. Uh, Dan Burnett is one of a uh, you know sort of a real. Um, uh, Longtime uh, expert in the standard space, he was the co-chair of the Verifiable Claims Working Group, creates the Verifiable Credential Standard, uh, and he's uh, part of the uh, standards team at Consensus. And uh, Brett Zondel uh, is one of my uh, uh, colleagues at, at Everdim uh, and is one of the uh, senior cryptographic engineers there. Uh, was very involved in the verifiable claims spec, has been a part of the DKMS work from the very outset, knows DIDs really well, and has a fabulous sense of humor. And uh, uh, anyway, there, there are uh, editor, uh, I mean, our chair team. Um, we Three of us that have been the editors uh, at the Credentials Community Group are continuing here, uh, Manny Sporny from Digital Bazaar and Marcus and myself. Uh, and then we have a total now of 54 participants from 18 member companies uh, or organizations at um, um, W3C. And I've, I've, I've put in uh, the, the names of all the participating organizations here. Some of them, are, I think, are, are quite familiar, you know, like uh, Microsoft and, and uh, uh, SecureKey um in this space uh transmute is is working on a dead method for that we'll talk about more in a minute and some are names you may not be as familiar with but uh are are quite uh deeply into the space now the only governmental entity participating directly right now is, is the scottish government uh we're hoping to get a a, 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 a scotch uh, or scottish credentials ecosystem uh, going here i had great um, great meeting about that, uh, or topic on that here today was as I was in London. That would be a great future SSI meetup, uh, Alex, letting you know there. Um, but there are, uh, I, there are some other uh, uh, governments that I know, uh, government agencies that are working on now joining W3C so they can be part of this group. So if you are interested, uh, if your organization uh, would like to be a part of this work, uh, by all means, join W3C. Uh, happy to share more information about doing that. Um, now, the deliverables of the working group, in other words, what is charter to deliver, very straightforward. Um, one specification, uh, we're going to decentralized identifier spec. Uh, when you produce material that's not a, a spec, it's just information about it, those are called notes, and we are uh, we have two notes. One is uh, use cases. There's some great work that have been done there already, uh, led by Joe Andrew. We'll talk uh, more about uh, uh, that. But then there's uh, something else that we, is our last topic. We have it here in the in the slides. I hope we have good time to get to it. Uh, although it's probably worthy of its own webinar. 
uh, on what we call uh, uh, rubrics, the decentralized uh, uh, characteristics, um, defining what decentralized, or, or at least how to um, um, measure different aspects of decentralization. So that's a separate document that we've decided we're, we're uh, going to be uh, doing. And then finally, a test suite and implementation report, um, because we, we do want uh, interoperability uh, uh, of DIDs is 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 critical to uh, this kind of infrastructure. Um, and I want to uh, quickly just uh, provide uh, a slide here that Dan Burnett created. Uh, there's quite a bit on this slide, but I just want to parse it out to give you a sense of okay, we have a, our charter is a two-year charter, um, but things are going to go much faster than you might think when you hear that word to your charter. And that's because this slide, these acronyms uh, are actually, uh, uh, we'll quickly unpack them. They stand for WD is working draft. That's what you go through as a series of working drafts until you reach consensus in the group that you're ready for what's called uh, a candidate recommendation, that's CR. Um, and that's where you get, uh, you have to have consensus of the working group and you start your public review period. When you're satisfied that it's ready, uh, you go to PR, proposed recommendation, and that gets wider review by W3C members and the public. And when you're really ready, um, then finally you can go to a, uh, a, a rec. Um, a, a, and that's, uh, it's called recommendation, W3C recommendation. That's their term for a full W3C standard. <laughs> so um, that is our goal here with this. And since you want to uh, allow time, roughly four months for each of those uh, advancing through those stages, if we back up, you can see that uh, we actually, starting up, uh, we want to go from uh, the current uh, 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 CCG spec that was contributed and accepted by the working group members uh, in Fukuoka, we want to uh, uh, turn that into calls the first public working draft here uh, by November and then advance it to the point of what we call feature freeze in May of next year. So just a six month period before we are at something that we consider to be ready to go through this whole process. And ideally there are very, very small changes in each of the following steps as we really polish it down. So even though it's a two-year charter, it's really the next six months is going to be the uh, uh, the concentrated work, uh, which means uh, you know, uh, Marks and I are really not going to get any sleep in that period. Um, okay, uh, I know we've got a, a, a lot still to cover here, so um, uh, I think we're unless there are any questions about that, we want to. We're going to go into the most interesting part, uh, at least from my perspective, of what we uh, ended up covering as a working group together and then discussing again with the other groups. And we're calling this the Did Deep Dive um, because um, even though there's already a lot to what we're after, the, the four years of working on DIDs have really exposed um, uh, a lot, you know, a lot more um, variance and uh, functionality to DIDs than then at least I originally anticipated. I don't know, maybe Marcus saw this all coming. Um, but, uh, and, and so we had actually four different presentations were given in uh, one, one half day of the working group on the afternoon of the first day. Um, and we have a number of slides here uh, answering questions and, uh, about uh, those variety of dids. Um, and so I'm just gonna dive into this and, uh, um, there are more slides here than we can comfortably cover, so I'm going to go relatively uh, quickly, um, just keeping an eye on the time. Um, and if questions pile up, Alex, just interrupt us, okay? All right, so the, the main question is, uh, how many different types of DIDs? Now, we've talked about 32 DID methods, but what are the, what are the overall categories? Uh, and what we're seeing is that even though the the original concept was that uh, DIDs would use, uh, to be decentralized, they would use blockchains and decentralized uh, uh, ledgers or distributed ledgers. What we found was that uh, there are other ways to um, provide the function of DIDs that are not necessarily based on ledgers. Um, one of the first to appear uh, was, wait a minute, DIDs can also be generated and shared peer-to-peer. 
they don't require public ledger and and you have tremendous privacy if you're only sharing a uh, 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 did with with one other peer or a small group of peers um, so that was that was the second dimension then um, uh, we had a whole presentation on uh, what are referred to as layer two dids which are dids that leverage they do leverage blockchain or DLT but that's only for ultimately anchoring uh, a, a, a layer two solution that adds uh, uh, scalability and decreases uh, the cost, uh, hopefully by order of magnitude or more. And uh, Daniel Buckner from, uh, from from Microsoft presented on uh, the work that they have done um, uh, and, and, and published open source in uh, the Decentralized Identity Foundation. We have a few slides from that. And then there's a whole fourth category of alternative uh, DIDs, which just stretch the boundaries. And that's where it really gets interesting. So um, uh, we're just gonna dive in. Uh, Marcus, uh, just, uh, go ahead. Drone, just, just a brief question from Michael, I was asking. Um, are, P2P, are P2P related, uh, are P2P DIDs related to delegated credentials? And he's also asking if the same applies for layer two. Um, any of these can be uh, uh, can apply to delegated credentials. There's no direct uh, connection between the type of uh, DID, meaning the type of system um, that it that it's designed for, and whether it can be used for a delegated credential. Um, it, it's a great question in terms of the relationship of DIDs and delegated credentials as a whole. That's another <laughs> this is a webinar, Alex. Um, but I would say that all of these could be used uh, with delegated credentials. Um, certainly peer-to-peer, -peer, there's going to be an extra dimension to it. But let's just uh, let's dive down into this and get a sense of, of these four categories. We, we, we have slides on all four, and we'll, we'll go through those, and they'll probably unleash a torrent of questions. We'll just use the time we have <laughs> um, and see where we go. So... Um, Again, it surprised a lot of folks, folks that were new to uh, uh, to the working group, that uh, that there were DIDs outside of distributed ledgers. So we want to talk about ledger based, -based DIDs. Um, I, I do want to make sure it's clear because I went in and did a count uh, in preparing these slides. And of the 32 methods, over 90% of them are in fact ledger based. Um, whether it's you know well known permission permissionless ledgers like Bitcoin and Ethereum, or it's um, other uh, ledgers of all kinds, um, most DIDs methods that have been created are for those. Um, and they break into the in, in two basic subtypes, and Marcus gave you a, a great presentation on this. Um, either the DID is based on the blockchain address or a variant uh, uh, derived from the blockchain address um, when, you, when you make a transaction with the blockchain to create the DID, or the DID is derived from a public-private key pair entirely independently of the blockchain, and then it's registered on the blockchain um, using the uh, uh, private key to uh, prove control of that uh, DID in the DID document. Um, and there are, there, you know, both of these are quite, there are quite a few DID methods based on the first approach and quite a few on the second approach. Sovereign uh, is an example of using the second approach. Um, and many different curves represented here too. So, Marcus, Thomas, what get, is the difference? Go ahead. Sorry, um, between a blockchain address and a public-private key address. How do so, you differentiate between the two? Well, it depends on the blockchain um, because uh, they are, you know, many blockchains are, are, you know, it, it depends on blockchain design. Now, Marcus, you gave the uh, the presentation and. Uh, we're summarizing a good 20 slides that you went down into this. So how would you answer that question, Marcus? Yes, yeah, so I, I would say, for, first of all, let's let's clarify those categories. They are not absolute categories that, that we're defining or anything like that. These are just uh, some common patterns that, that are emerging, uh, right? And even even within these categories, if we say they're blockchain or ledger-based data, there's a lot of variation in there, that, that's that's because deeds and did methods and did resolution are defined in, in in an abstract way, and, and there are many different ways how a did method uh, can be can be defined as as long as there's a well defined syntax for the did itself and a well defined uh, algorithm for retrieving or dynamically constructing the did document. As as long as that is possible, uh, you can have a edit method, and and because that is so 
generic and, and universal, there are many different ways how, how that works, in, including how the identifier itself gets generated. And some of the very early designs, the, the initial, some initial ideas uh, years ago about deeds in, involved uh, just creating a random random number, uh, basically a UUID. So you, you create a UUID. And uh, and then you register that on on a blockchain by by signing it with a, with a key pair that you that, that you generated. That that was the very first uh, earliest variation of a, of a did was just a random a random number. But then over time, uh, other other ideas came up, in, including a, like a DID being more like a Bitcoin address, where the, the DID is the hash of a public key or something like that. Uh, uh, but then there were even even more ideas, right? For for the Bitcoin-based deeds, uh, BTCR, uh, the deed is is not is not a random number and it's not derived from a key pair, but it's actually a an address, uh, a pointer to a specific transaction inside a specific block on the Bitcoin blockchain, and and all of that is fine, right? As as long as there's a well-defined way uh, how to how to look up that I that identifier and uh, somehow. Get the uh, get the de- de- document, and, and I think we'll see uh, more creative approaches. And and uh, so let's not consider these uh, categories as an as an exhaustive uh, list or as or any any strong uh, strongly defined set of of, of types of deed methods that that we can have because it's really very very open uh, open uh, system. I, I want to stress the metaphor that comes to mind for me is a little bit like, uh, you know, biologists in the early days, uh, they weren't, they didn't sit down and go, well, there should be these, uh, you know, we're going to, we're going to say there should be these uh, species of animals. Rather, they went and looked, uh, you know, at the world and said, oh, we're noticing that there tend to be these, uh, you know, these mammals and these insects and these other, and they, they just sort of, uh, categorized what nature had had created and that's what's happening here uh, even though we started out thinking about hey dids are you know ledgers the ways to do dids now we're just seeing them start to multiply and we're sort of saying hey we're seeing these characteristics among ledger based dids um now as i said one of the things that then uh that emerged and this was maybe uh, roughly uh, a year into the, the whole thing was Hey, wait a minute! You don't have to have a ledger. And uh, so Ken Ebert from the Sovereign Foundation uh, gave a great presentation on uh, peer dits, um, uh, which which are the the other end of the spectrum. So these next couple of slides are from uh, Ken, and uh, he he shared these are three terms actually from the Sovereign Glossary, um, uh, talking about the different uh, the the, the uh, uh, a scope of, of uniqueness and resolvability of a DID and the broadest scope at the top of what we often call public DIDs, technically the, uh, the term uh, uh, the sovereign community uses anywise DIDs. Anyone uh, can, can uh, find out about it. You don't know who's using the DID because it's publicly out there. It's, it's, it's like a, uh, you know, a public domain name or a public IP address where anyone can, can discover it and resolve it. Then NYS is a group. It's only used within a group. It's it's not publicly available, but the members of the group know it. And then pairwise is just two parties, and uh, and and so peer dids are really aimed at the second two categories. Um, a, he had an example here. What does a peer did look like? Uh, it's a um, it's it's classic. Just three level. Uh, a, a peer is the uh, actually then, but the first two digits of the peer did uh, are designed to the, these, uh, what I'm putting it here, the, uh, uh, the algorithm for selecting the underlying um, uh, number that will be used, uh, the, the, the random number generator uh, or, or technique for generating something that's unique. And the second part the, uh, is the encoding algorithm. So one number uh, uh, represents the first and the other one the second. And, these are uh, designed to be extensible, so as, as more you know, secure ways or more efficient ways of, of generating peer dids are developed, um, they'll just be added to the peer did spec. Uh, right now, there's one uh, uh, 
numeric algorithm and one encoding algorithm, and uh, then the, the numbers of base 64 encoded um, uh, uh, set of hex digits. And uh, I, think, I think that's uh, the whole thing right now. I'm not sure what other um, um, variants of the uh, of those algorithms are being defined. There is a spec. I don't uh, have the uh, uh, link right here uh, to the peer did spec, um, but um, it's available in the did method registry, which is linked in in this. Marcus, anything else uh, you want to mention about peer dids? Mm, no, I think I think that's it. One 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 thing we can, can observe there is that uh, nobody is saying that states must be globally resolvable, right? So these states say they are just resolvable within a specific relationship, and that's uh, totally fine. Exactly, uh, that's it, it. Is a really good point. The resolvability doesn't need to be you know everywhere. Now, uh, Ken summarized the. Uh, the benefits appear to this way that uh, you know one one thing is they're, they're very inexpensive uh, you know essentially uh, free if you just if you don't count the, the compute time to generate one uh, very fast to do that um, totally scalable because they don't depend on a blockchain or, or ledger uh, um, the security is based on the the uh, again the, the the uniqueness of the generation and the fact that it's only shared. Um, the pure did protocol, uh, actually, I call it the uh, uh, did equivalent of Diffie-Hellman key exchange in terms of negotiating uh, the, the initial exchange. And then, of course, because it's only shared at a peer basis, um, it, it's, it's even more private than dids that are already pseudonymous, even if they're on a public ledger. Um, so these are, and, and uh, Ken also talked about what we call graftability, meaning because they're all unique, um, and, and within namespaces that are designed to be unique, um, you, can, you can graph together DIDs that are used, uh, peer DIDs with other system, you know, with other DIDs that uh, might be uh, uh, public, uh, you know, the, again, uh, uh, NYs or NYs uh, DIDs and use them all together. So it's a, uh, it's a, it's a fascinating category. I'm going to mention here quickly that uh, the Hyperledger Aries project uh, at Hyperledger um, peer dids are going to be a, a standard there for Aries agents or wallets uh, to support peer dids. It's just going to be built in. Um, hopefully, you know, many other dids types of dids will be supported, but peer dids are part of the uh, uh, the Aries spec suite. Now, Ken also talked about another kind uh, that's of, of essentially uh, or, or a did that would be used uh, typically peer to peer, but it's even simpler. It's just a public key did. And he also had a set of slides on that. And uh, he shows you an example here. Um, this format was originally developed, uh, I think, by uh, um, Digital Bazaar. And uh, they have a, a spec again. It's, it's all listed in the, in the registry uh, at uh, the Credentials Community Group. And this one is basically entirely based on a, a public private key pair. And what you're doing is you're um, encoding the uh, public key. Uh, you're creating the DID from the public key using an encoding. Um, in this case, their spec calls out uh, using the multibase uh, encoding. Uh, and uh, Marcus, have you, uh, have you actually uh, uh, coded this or have you worked with um, uh, the DID, did key um, DIDs yet? Uh, a little bit. I mean, this is this is not the first did method that that proposes to do something like that, where the did itself is basically just a wrapped uh, public key. The, the Uport community has uh, proposed that that before, uh, just in a slightly different format, involving multiple different did methods for different key types. Uh, you know, yeah. It's interesting. Those did, uh, strictly speaking, they they don't support all the four CRUD operations, right? They don't uh, support the update or the deactivate operations. You can only uh, create and and resolve them. And in the the community group, uh, the last few years there was a discussion around that whether that should be considered a did or or something else or some other type of identifier. Uh, right now, I think the community consensus is that. It's fine to also call this a date, even though it doesn't support all the all the operation. But uh, 
that just uh, that just shows again how uh, how broad the data concept uh, can be and how it can be can be adapted to uh, to different use cases. Exactly, um, and 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 Marcus is right. There was I was one of the folks when it first came out that spoke up and said, "Wait a minute, that's that is that really a DID?" But uh, again, under the sort of um, big tent approach and recognizing that a standard way to associate an identifier with a key pair has a lot of use. Uh, I've come around to saying, okay, it's a, it may be a very sp specific kind, and it doesn't support all four of the uh, of the of the properties. It's not updatable, um, uh, and resolution is 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 basically entirely local, but it's still useful. And and you can see the benefits that uh, Ken Ebert here described of a uh, <coughs> public key based uh, data, again, very, very similar to uh, to pure dids. So in the interest of time, uh, we've only covered two of the, of the four categories here. So let's keep going and quickly give you a sense of these other two. Uh, again, the next uh, set of um, uh, slides are credited to Daniel Buckner from Microsoft, who wasn't able to attend in person, but gave this uh, presentation remotely. Um, and he talked about uh, ION, um, which is the uh, layer two did network that was announced by Microsoft at Consensus back in May. And uh, it's, it's a pretty exciting project and uh, a great presentation. I've only got a handful of the slides here that sort of summarize ION very quickly. Um, yeah, I, I like this one from Daniel where he uh, was trying to make sure that it was you know, uh, clear that the scale of decentralized identity, identity and the use of DIDs is far more than, uh, far broader than just people. Um, and you'll hear us regularly on SSI Meetup talk about the fact that SSI is not just for people. It's for organizations and it's for things, all the things, um, which uh, if you're an IoT enthusiast, uh, go you know, scale into the trillions. So um, he wanted to capture that that's why Microsoft's view for quite a while has been we need really scalable DIDs, and uh, but their view was a little bit different than the peer DID or public key DID approach. It was it was to say, hey, we can we can make them uh, uh, we can layer over um, conventional or, 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 or uh, existing blockchains so we can get the trust uh, sort of trust roots in those chains, uh, and 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 yet still get the scalability. And this he summed it up in this uh, key realization slide. Um, that um, DIDs need to be unique, but they're not transferred uh, uh, like uh, cryptocurrencies. Um, so um, they can they allow you to create a different kind of network or architecture of the network. And he summarized that uh, in, in defining ION as a public permissionless but decentralized DID overlay network. And ION specifically uses protocol called SideTree, but layers it over Bitcoin. And uh, there's uh, another instance of the side tree protocol being created to layer over Ethereum called Element from Transmute, who is a member of the uh, did working group. And I think if they, has there already been an SI meetup or do you have one upcoming here with Transmute, Alex? Yeah, I just wanted to mention that uh, we had Iron being presented by Daniel, I think in June. And I think we had Element in July. So if anyone wants to check out these two methods in, in more detail, or, or these two second layer methods, um, you can check them out in, at SSI, SSI Meetup and you, you will be able to see it in all detail. Yep, that's what I thought. It's, it's already been uh, really great in both cases. Um, he, Daniel finished with a slide of this that, that is uh, shared uh, his and Microsoft's view of how these networks are going to evolve that uh, um, anyone, again, it's permissionless. So uh, initially they expect some large entities like Microsoft to be running nodes to jumpstart the network. Smaller ones will start to come in and, and over time you'll end up with a long tail of developers and users and organizations all running a mixture of light and full nodes to make for a very robust decentralized network. So, um, so that's the, the story of, of layer two. Before I go to the last one, Marcus, do you want to, uh, any comment on, on the layer two approach? 
Well, those are the ones I'm probably least least familiar with. I I, I think one of the first approaches was similar to that was what what Blockstack Block Stack was doing, uh, where you also register identifiers mostly in some layer two network and only use the blockchain for uh, for anchoring uh, many identifiers in a very efficient way. Mm. Yeah, it just it just shows how. Uh, how some people are already are really thinking about very very large scale on for deploying this. Exactly, definitely scale. Uh, the the folks that were uh, uh, Pamela Dingle, who's uh, the head of identity standards at uh, Microsoft, was there at the meeting and is a full member of the working group, uh, along with Daniel Buckner and also Mike Jones, that uh, uh, many folks may know from Microsoft's work on OpenID, and he's. Uh, uh, going to be uh, a full member of the working group as well. So uh, very, very rich interest on part of uh, uh, Microsoft and others in Layer 2. Now, the last set, uh, and, and this you know, could practically be a, a whole um, a webinar in itself, uh, is a category that would just generally, uh, the, we're calling alternative DIDs. And this presentation was created by Mandy Sporny of Digital Bazaar, who's been involved with the ideas, as I said, that he and... Uh, Dave Longley coined the term uh, from the very outset. So he's seen these, these evolve. And uh, I've shortened down, again, these to just uh, slides on the, um, the, the core uh, alternatives that he uh, described. And again, they all, they all again, we're, we're, we're sort of adding this categorization uh, ex post facto here um, because uh, we're just seeing these things uh, emerge. And, and some of them are fairly controversial. <laughs> Uh, so quickly, I'll just I'll step through them and then I'll, uh, I'll let Marcus uh, comment because there's been a lot of discussion about these because um, we sort of pushed the envelope. So uh, the first one, did web, um, is basically saying, hey, why can't you create a did just by putting a did document any place out there on the web? Um, and uh, you'll see the pros and cons here of each of these. Um, uh, the there, of course, there are security considerations. Um, there is the whole question, well, how persistent is it? Because web addresses, if they depend on DNS or IP addresses, there is no guarantee necessarily of persistence. However, it's very easy to do and, uh, and would extend the, uh, the space of DIDs to everything on the web. Uh, Mark, so I'm going to go through all of these and then and then uh, let you comment on it because otherwise we'll be going on for a very long time. So that's the did web method. Uh, another one that's that is, uh, totally fascinating is uh, was came from uh, developers that were working with uh, did almost all developers uh, or many many are using uh, Git and GitHub, and they recognize that since you're signing. Um, uh, Git uh, repositories, Git um, um, uh, commits to Git repositories. There, there, there are many standard ways to do that to ensure the integrity of the code there. And uh, that DIDs could standardize and help uh, uh, automate and, and make that process interoperable, uh, both with different Git repositories and uh, with GitHub. So, um, this method is, is really uh, taken off, and there's, there's great interest in being implemented at the Linux Foundation uh, already. Uh, Dave Hughesby has been one of the, who is the security maven at Hyperledger, uh, has been very active, uh, along with a number of other developers on this method. Um, and again, does not involve, it essentially treats uh, uh, repos, good repos as the decentralized um, uh, system. It's not necessarily a ledger in the conventional sense, but uh, but that's how it works. Um, again, I'm going to finish up, Marcus, on these other two. Uh, IPID uh, uh, DIDs for the IPFS uh, ecosystem um, is, is, is saying, hey, DIDs can work on a DHT-based uh, clustered file system. Um, and uh, there's, a, a, again, folks in that community that are very active, uh, have, have been in the community for quite a while. And lastly, probably the most controversial, this is where I want to tee up Marcus because he's been very active in discussion. Uh, we've just been calling them the did proprietary. That's not an actual method. It just stands for the fact that, well, what if, what if, organizations, uh, Facebook being used as an example here, just came in and said, hey, we want to create a method. We're a huge provider. We, a lot of folks 
uh, trust our namespace, we'll, we'll open up. Uh, we've got namespaces, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Gmail, you name it, uh, where the, the namespace is just owned by an organization and they, and they assign dids and they're as persistent as that organization, uh, um, you know, says they are. Um, and I'm going to stop right there, Marcus, and let you, uh, you know, uh, share your views on, on these alternative did methods. Well, I think this is, this is exactly why the, why the did uh, concept and the did community is, is so interesting, uh, because the, the emergence of some of these new alternative uh, did, did methods really really reflect uh, the fact that uh, deeds are, are not just uh, a neutral and objective technology, but there are always, they're always these questions about political values and, and social values and about what it, uh, what it means to have an identity, right? Um, as, as Christopher Allen always explains it, SSI, self-sovereign identity, which is very closely related to deeds, uh, is, uh, is not just a technology and an architecture, it's also an ideology, right? So we're, yes, we're building uh, technical building blocks for a uh, for new type of, of identity architecture, but we're also building uh, values for a, for a new digital uh, information society, right? We are asking, what does it mean to have an identity and, and what should it be like and uh, what does it mean to be independent and we use terms such as digital slavery and digital enlightenment and and so on so that's why uh, that's why some of these new did methods are are emerging and uh, and then we just have to have to keep that in mind that as we build this technology we also have to be uh, responsible and, uh, and, and consider the the implications, right? So if we have something like like did Facebook, then then we can argue that it's it's probably not exactly a decentralized identifier if there's one company in in control of it. Uh, but on on the other hand, uh, maybe we should have that freedom as well to to be able to choose whether I want to uh, want to base my identity on the, on a decentralized ledger. Or I want to entrust uh, Facebook with with controlling it. Maybe that choice uh, should actually be there, or or not. So these are just uh, questions that I, I think will uh, will keep coming up as we as we write the as we work on the technical standard because it's it's so closely uh, related to to non technical questions. Absolutely. This is. Uh, uh, I I want to emphasize something here. These. Um, uh, examples you see here uh, at the upper right are hypothetical examples. We're not saying any of these have been uh, registered uh, again in the informal did uh, method registry because there is no authoritative uh, did method registry. That is a, a, a discussion, an active discussion at the working group and among the, the larger community. But these are just examples that we created to to show uh you know what what they could look like these sort of examples get a lot of discussion in the in the, uh, in the community now that leads us into our last topic and i'm just keeping uh a uh, uh an eye on time here um uh, so we'll, we'll we'll just go into this quickly and then uh, uh alex take questions and uh, and wrap up um the whole question of well what what really is decentralized? What, what does it mean? Uh, that's generated tremendous discussion, especially in the last six months as DITS has really moved out there and prepared to go to the full working group. And uh, the whole concept of, of that we could create uh, a rubric. And uh, Joe Andrew here uh, created these slides and presented on this and also heads up uh, the rubric uh, task force that the credentials community group uh, has created and uh, this work is going to roll now into the uh, full did working group. He created these slides um, and that quickly summarized the idea, trying to define uh, uh, what decentralization means is, is a complex subject. And um, there is no one answer. There's, there's, there are multiple ways of, of, of looking at it and defining it. Uh, it depends on the perspective of, of uh, the, the party that, that wants to, uh, uh, you know, rely on a particular did method, what, what they need. So um, this is actually the text from the did working group charter, 
that uh, were charged to provide a rubric, a, a, a basically an evaluation system, a scoring system for uh, for the decentralization characteristics of DID methods. <laughs> now, why do we need this? As, as Joe put it, decentralized is a quagmire. It's, it's very difficult to define what it really means. And we had very intense and passionate debate around this. And uh, as that distilled out, we realized there are a number of ways of, of, of sort of um, uh, qualities or, or um, uh, scales or properties of decentralization. And what we should do is, is create a, uh, a guide to these things, a, a set of them, and then let um, the users of the of, of, of did infrastructure decide uh, what methods meet their requirements or their uh, that can they be evaluated against. And uh, this will give us a tool that so, so there is no we don't have to be judgmental about what is or is not the, the you know a, a, a sufficiently decentralized did method, but rather we can publish this and say you you decide uh, evaluation is in the eye of the beholder as Joe put it here. And uh, but the rubrics can give you uh, a guide to the the factors that you might want to consider. There will be no summary rating universal metric from the working group. Uh, others may decide. Uh, folks might be familiar with the EFF, the Electronic uh, Freedom Foundation, has uh, uh, maintained a uh, uh, secure messaging scorecard. Um, they developed it, managed it for a couple of years, uh, then I think it went on. Uh, hold but they're they're bringing it back because there are many different factors involved with how secure is a secure messaging protocol and uh so that's that's a uh, a prototype for the type of thing that we want to produce here and uh and that's just the three slides i have to summarize uh, uh marcus um before we go into final questions here uh since you were very involved in the ideas uh, and the discussion about uh, uh the need for the rubrics uh you want to comment on that uh, I, I think you I think you basically said it all um, yeah decentralization is, is not something that uh, we can write in the in the standard in a, in a normative way right it cannot be we cannot enforce that we cannot force people to only create the methods that are truly decentralized because uh, first of all like you said, it's it's a complex topic to define decentralization. And on the other hand, uh, who are we to uh, prohibit people from uh, creating DIN methods the the way uh, that they want? So uh, that's that's not the objective here. It's not uh, the, the the goal is not to prevent uh, certain DIN methods. And as you as you said, uh, which is also important, that uh, this is not a scoring system where there is no good or bad. It it will not create a an official rating. It's more a, a tool for individuals and developers and, and users and, and organizations to evaluate certain methods for specific purposes. Exactly. All right. Well, that's uh, that's a, a lot to cover. I was I was uh, here thinking we'd be giving a short update report on this first meeting, but there was so much great material there that uh, we. Uh, it took a while, but Alex, are there any other questions queued up that we should cover? Yeah, no, I think this is awesome. Thank you so much, um, Drummond and, and, and Marcus. I think this is amazing. Um, if there are any questions, please share them now. Um, I have a couple of questions, um, and um, just to contextualize this a little bit, um, I mean, I had a front seat now in, in the SSI space now for three years. Um, uh, thanks to you, Drummond, and thanks to Marcus, many other people that have been helping me in, in having that front seat. And, uh, and but three years is just nothing, and and so I just keep on realizing all the time how ignorant I am. And since we're working also together um, with many other people of the key people in the space, like I mean, some of you will know that um, with Drummond and with Marcus, many other key people, we're writing this book about decentralized digital identity. Um, I, I would like to ask a couple of questions that I had for a long time. I think I have the answers to some of them, but I, I think it would also benefit everyone else who's listening to this webinar like to, to get your views and, and answers to that. Um, so I'm just going to ask them, and 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 um, and I think this will also help us for the book we're writing, but also just help everyone else. So one one the first question I have is, um, and please anyone else who has any question, please jump in. And 
I think one of the key questions that everyone is missing all the time is then how are DIDs different to URIs and why do we need DIDs? I mean, you had the four conditions there, but I think we still struggle in the community to convey in a simple and quick way, uh, hey, this is why a DID is really relevant. Um, so that, that would be my, my, my first question. And by the way, I think from all the DID um, webinars we've done so far, this is the best one. And I really feel that um, we're getting every time better in explaining this so that it's understandable as the ecosystem evolves and, and matures. So that, that would be my first question. And it is a really good question. And I, you know, as someone that's been involved for such a long time, I know I have a, a, a you know, a forest for the trees kind of problem. Um, and and because we had to anticipate, um, you know, a number of new working group members coming in, uh, that's why there's, there's, uh, you know, you saw contributions from many of us here in, in these slides and the presentations and discussions there. And I think we did sharpen the pencil on answering that question. Um, when we discuss those four properties, um, I, I, I used to talk about, you know, a, a decentralization. That's the key thing for uh, that, that distinguishes DIDs from other forms of URIs. Um, but now I tend to talk about, concentrate if, if, on, on that particular slide. I'll, I'll, I'll go back to it here as we're, as we're talking just to uh, pull it up. Um, I, I now concentrate on the... the uh, um, the cryptographic verifiability um, that that it is a key piece of uh, of, of of creating infrastructure that will be um, uh, allow uh, cryptographic verification of many many different things. Uh, you know, uh, obviously authentication is 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 one of the core uh, core things, um, but. Uh, being able to do secure messaging, secure transmission of uh, data. Um, there's so many things that you could, I'm, I'm building this, this slide up here to say of these four things. If I had to, if I, if someone asked me now, nowadays at a cocktail party, well, what's different about a DID? Um, I literally use this line. I say, imagine that you have an identifier that uh, you can prove control of um, without relying on any other party, that you you can do it yourself, um, and that as a result you can use that for secure communications with any other party on the internet, um, and and again you don't have to work through a service provider or a third party or some administrator to do so. That's what I key in on, and uh, I think we'll come up with better and better ways of of talking about that, but. Um, sometimes use the analogy people ask, what was different about an IP address? Um, it, it, as you mentioned, Alex, we're writing, uh, I'm working on this uh, chapter of the book on DIDs, and I want to compare them with all the forms of addresses we have before that. Well, with the internet, it was like, well, yeah, we've had network addresses for a long time. What was special about an internet, an IP address, internet protocol address? Well, the answer was, it was designed to work with a global network, with a worldwide network. You could put anything on the internet with an IP address and it could talk to anything else. Well, there'd never been an address like that. That's what the breakthrough was. In this case, we're saying anything can connect to anything and form a cryptographically verifiable connection. Um, we've never had that without the need for intermediaries. So that's my answer, but I'm curious what Marcus's answer is. Yeah, I think all of, all of that is right. Uh, lots of uh, technical properties that make it interesting and, and different from other identifiers, and you've, you've covered covered all of that. I, I think there's one more aspect that's really new or really innovative about this that we actually haven't talked about so much in the in the community yet, and uh, and that's the fact that. These were were designed from the beginning to be identifiers for uh, what what semantic pe web people would call real world uh, resources, so meaning individuals, organizations, and things unlike uh, IP addresses or HTTP URIs or or domain names. Those are identifiers for technical building blocks, right? For for web servers or or for uh, web pages, documents. On the web and there's this old problem that's known as the HTTP range 14 
problem, uh, which says that uh, how can we how can we distinguish between identifying digital resources that exist only on the web and the real world uh, things and, and people and, and organizations. And when you look at an HTTP URL, uh, for example, you you don't really know that. Are you you don't really know whether you're talking about the the website that exists in the in the digital space, or are you talking about the real world? object or, or resource that's described by the web page and that's an important distinction as the semantic web community has been has been struggling with that for a while and it's also a, a very important uh, question for for the, for us since we're working on digital identity we've never had that before we've never had an identity type of identifier before where we would say this is specifically about Drummond or about the SSI meetup organization or about a specific thing. We've always had identifiers for the digital representations of, of those things. And, and, and I think without talking about it much, just in, in, intuitively, or um, it, it, this has been also one of the one of the real uh, great things about this. And I, I think we will realize that uh, more and more. There you go, Alex. Two two rather deep answers to a deep question. Absolutely, and I think we really need to practice on that um, because I, I really feel that you guys are getting much better because you did most of the DID, both of you, DID webinars we had so far. And, and, and as I said before, I think I really feel another um, level up here because I think you just really you've been sharpening the pencil as you said. Next question I have is um, how, how, how important do you do you consider DIDs to be as part of a whole architecture in an SSI ecosystem? And, and I'm saying this because I see some people that maybe are not as familiar with the SSI ecosystem, what it stands for and what it's trying to achieve. They just say, oh, we are doing DID. Like DID specifically just means decentralized identity. And I think a lot of the subjects related to what is decentralization and what is not decentralization and why is it even relevant is a little bit related to that. But my sense, and please correct me if you think otherwise, the DID is, is a fundamental thing because it's one piece of many pieces that you need to build an SSI architecture. Um, and then depending on, on your objectives, it might be one way or another way. Um, but um, what what is the le level of importance to give to DIDs as part of that overall thing? Is it like the most important piece or is it one piece of other important pieces? And if yes, what are the other important pieces? I'm going to flip this around and uh, have Marcus go first just to uh, uh, switch it up. Um, he he, uh, he, he is, is a developer and someone who's working on this for a long time. I'm curious, Marcus, what's your answer to that? Yeah, I do think it's it's absolutely a core piece of, of an SSI uh, architecture. It, in the in the different communities that are working on SSI solution, it seems to be the, uh, the 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 common denominator, right? It's the piece of an architecture that that everybody or almost everybody ag agrees on, and uh, it, it really has to do with the. Uh, with, with the fundamental question, how does an identity get established? What is the act uh, uh, that you go through uh, after which you can say that now you have a digital identity? And I, I think it starts with that. I, with 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 the deeds, I I would say that SSI can be done also without it. So the deeds are not the only types of identifiers that are self-sovereign. Uh, so there, there can be other types of identifiers like. Uh, local names, uh, linked local names uh, that are that are not bits, uh, but also fulfill uh, the principles of of SSI. But in 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 practice, all pretty much all the initiatives out there that work work on SSI and decentralized identity, they they use these and, and then they build uh, other things like credentials and hubs and agents and and so on. They build that on on top of it. Uh, yeah. As usual, Marks and I are in vinyl agreement about many things. Um, I use the analogy, Alex, and, and I, uh, in fact, in, a, in, a, in a quite a long meeting uh, that I was here in, in London today with uh, some, some, you know, security architects that go way back and, you know, have some of the early work in, in this. 
uh, and the whole area of the cryptographic infrastructure and PKI, public key infrastructure that we you know, rely upon uh, today. Um, and uh, they really were diving into the analogy of uh, DIDs are, are, are basically uh, like IP addresses for a cryptographic network, right? They're like cryptographically verifiable IP. They're the IP addresses of the cryptographic web. And uh, we, we talked earlier about how the web, this is a whole other dimension of the web where we're extending it to, um, you know, to, to a trust infrastructure where it's not just specific web pages, specific websites that use HTTPS certificates, but it's just the cryptographic uh, security and, and provability is woven right into the fabric of the web. These, the DIDs are literally the, the, um, the, the tips of the knitting needles to, to weave in th that in. They're, they're, they're going to be everywhere. They are um, as essential, DIDs are as essential to the cryptographic web as IP addresses and domain names and URIs are to the web we, we use today. Um, which means as deep as we've gone in this, as for as much as progress we've seen in the next four years, I think we're going to be blown away by what we actually see built on DIDs in the next four years. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the level of visibility that we've now achieved, uh, you know, with this full working group, it's, it's just getting out to a larger audience um, and, you know, through mechanisms like this uh, and developers. I mean, for example, just to take one thing, as the did uh, get method, um, as that's adopted by the Linux Foundation and woven into uh, Git and, and ideal into GitHub, developers everywhere are going to start using DIDs as a daily tool. And that's just going to educate them. And then they're going to start to say, oh, I want to build this into, you know, the security um, infrastructure of my applications and my designs. And who knows? I, I think we're, it's, it's going to be another explosion of, of activity. So again, <laughs> deep questions, long answers. <laughs> no, but I, I, I'm just trying to take advantage because I'm really happy about this webinar and, and to have you guys together. So two more questions. Um, I, I don't think anyone else will be making more questions, but two more questions and just keep them short or long, uh, whatever you feel is necessary. Some people argue that um, what is being done at W3C or other standard groups is maybe relevant because in the sense that, okay, you have all these different companies collaborating there and trying to create a standard and maybe there will be just someone appearing, coming up with a bet better method where, where they just fulfill the needs of the market for whatever the market want right, wants right now because maybe people don't want decentralization or it's, they don't have, value that as highly and someone else might come up. I mean, how, how do you see that risk of someone coming out of nowhere just um, going in front and just making the work um, of, that has been done with verifiable credentials and DIDs. So just picking up some of that, but then just creating a whole new ecosystem that makes the work that has been, that is being tried to be standardized kind of irrelevant um, for, for in the big scheme of things. Uh, it's a it's a super good question, and I think it's it's particularly relevant because uh, every so often, you know, I'm I'm in conversations where folks are pointing out, you know, there was no standardization to required to create Bitcoin, right, or Ethereum, um, and uh, I think that's absolutely true. And I want to emphasize, uh, hopefully, it's clear from this webinar that there is no standardization uh, necessarily. There's no authority to go to to create a DID method. Um, what, what we're creating with the DID specification and the level of standardization we're seeking at W3C is agreement on how you can do it in a way where it can work with many other DID methods and we can get interoperability between, uh, between all of these uh, in a way that's, you know, it's, again, comparing it to like uh, IP addresses um, or the URI system that the web is based on. When you can get that level of interoperability and ubiquity, you can, you know, it can just, you can change many things. And uh, I think to build a whole infrastructure and, and what's going to be happening, uh, or we already see happening with the IDs, you do need, uh, you, there are different ways to accomplish it. Uh, there was several discussions I was in at the uh, TPAC about how standardization is moving to be more de facto standards that are set by open source communities and open source code and projects, you know, and, and, and decentralized projects like, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum. 
um, it's just it's just a reality. But I think those will be going in parallel with uh, with actual de jure standards like those that come from W3C and ITF, Oasis, you know, all the the uh, SDOs, standards development organizations. Um, they will go side by side, and I think what we're trying to do with with DIDs, uh, for example, is hit that medium ground where there's a base level of interop that the spec is about, and then it just encourages uh, uh, developers to just go create the DID method that they want to use and solve the problem their way. And then it's, you know, Darwinian selection, survival of the fittest in the market is is uh, um, what will work out. Marcus? Yeah, don't don't really have anything anything to add. Um, yeah, right. There, there is this there is this question: Will uh, will data as a standard be successful and adopted, or will will someone else just come up with uh, something alternative that's similar but that's not really this? Uh, at the same time, like like you said, we also uh, was looking forward to to finding out uh, how. The, the ecosystem of existing DIN methods will will evolve, right? Will we are we going to see architectures and deployments that support many different DIN methods? Will we have something like a universal resolution layer where everyone can choose their own DIN method and and everything will work together, or will we see more uh, environments where maybe a single DIN method will be uh, will be used and supported for a specific specific purpose? Uh, I don't know. I, I do think obviously that the data standard will be successful. Uh, that's why uh, we're working on it, and I, I think uh, I think that that's what will be adopted as there's already such a uh, such a such a strong community a, a around it. I, I don't think the incentive is is very strong for uh, someone to completely dismiss that or or create an, an alternative approach. At least that's what I hope. Thank you so much. Um, last question is, um, I mean, one of the new things I have the impression at least that we've been seeing coming up over the last 12 months maybe is is, is that, um, I mean, I think SSI has clearly established itself as something for itself that is independent of blockchain or anything else that it's really like where you have different components uh, that create this whole SSI ecosystem or uh, where you can create your SSI architecture. And one of the things that seems to have being reduced in importance as part of that architecture are the ledgers or the blockchain in itself. And I mean, especially because the whole discussion has been coming up, okay, what if peer-to-peer -peer DIDs um, are, are the thing and then most of the other DIDs, it's maybe just 10%, 20% of what is left. And um, what are your views on, on that um, in, in regards to the ledgers or blockchains about how relevant they've been or will be in, in the future and, and for these types of architectures? I, well, I, if I can, I can start start with that. Maybe I, 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 in a way, it's a little bit paradoxical that, uh, that there's so much interest in blockchain and identity because uh, some of the most fundamental features of of blockchains, uh, which are immutability, right? You put something there and then it never goes away, and uh, complete transparency. What you what you put on the blockchain, everybody can see it, at least with the traditional blockchains those features are are something that you that you exactly don't want uh, usually for identity systems right you don't want your data to be immutable and and, and completely public so that's why it's it, it has turned out to be quite uh, tricky and, and challenging and lots of uh, questions around what exactly should go on on the blockchain and, uh, and that's why it's good to have these different uh, data methods, which are not all blockchain-based. Um, one common pattern that, that I think uh, a large part of the community supports right now is that blockchain-based data would uh, not be used for individuals, right? They would be used for organizations, uh, but for individuals because of privacy and, and GDPR reasons, uh, other data methods like, like the peer method is, uh, are, is preferable. I I strongly agree, um, and I think uh, what I was going to joke, Alex, is every time I do uh, another SSI meetup webinar, 
it ends in a decision that we need another one. Or in this case, I think we've mentioned a half dozen that could come out of this. Um, but the one I definitely want to do soon, because I know I'm going to be doing uh, a session on it, uh, is uh, on the uh, uh, what's been broadly called. We started calling the SSI stack, and it is the SSI stack, but now there's an even broader term, the trust over IP stack, uh, as coined by John Jordan at the province of British Columbia in Canada. Um, and uh, I, I, we're, we're now writing this up uh, as a, uh, a, a Hyperledger Aries RFC uh, request for comment, um, uh, so that so that we have something that's that's referenceable in terms of the layers of that stack. And uh, I, I've what we've sort of uncovered is what you want to do with each of the layers. And the bottom layer is, you know, blockchains and public ledgers that are. Uh, where, as Marcus was saying, it makes sense to have strong uh, trust routes, not centralized trust routes, but strong trust routes that anyone can establish and maintain in order to build, uh, you know, to have an anchor of trust for whatever community needs it. Um, and those trust routes today are, um, you know, they're either governments or large companies or their certificate authorities that are in that business uh, for, for public key infrastructure, but they're all centralized um, pretty much and and it, they're all single points of failure. And so if we want to get to really robust, wide scale trust infrastructure for the internet, um, for the digital networks that we're now relying on for, you know, to run the world, um, we need to move to this decentralized infrastructure, and that base layer is still going to come from these very, very strong decentralized networks. That's why uh, I feel like we, we owe this debt to uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum and other uh, blockchain projects that have proved out uh, the, the, the security um, uh, properties of a decentralized system that's designed, you know, this cryptographic infrastructure they're building. I do think the stack will reveal, though, that um, the rest of what uh, uh, is built on top of that, um, for the reasons Marcus talked about, and for ones that we'll get in, in great detail, for the privacy, for the scalability, for the flexibility that you want, you want the layers above that to not have to be tied to, to uh, uh, a blockchain or distributed ledger uh, directly. You want to be able to, again, call those trust routes at the bottom layer. So I'll be look forward uh, enormously to uh to to doing a webinar on that um you know in the near future uh but hey we've got iaw coming up in two weeks and we've actually got uh my data uh in uh, helsinki uh next week uh i'll be there um marcus are you gonna be at my data yeah yeah i'll be there that's right. That's right. <laughs> we, so we had W3C and Marcus is, you know, giving several talks in between. I'm in London for a few days, but then we're going to be at my data next week. Um, another great conference. And then both of us are going to be at IW and Mountain View. So um, we'll plan on doing our, our IW wrap up as a webinar. Um, and then uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm certain we'll, we'll have a group of, uh, of, of us that will want, want to do one on the trust over IP stack uh, once we have that RFC out. That's wonderful. Um, thank you so much, Marcus. Thank you so much, Grammond. Um, I mean, this is the longest webinar we've ever done, but it's almost two, I mean, it's two hours now, but I think it has been incredibly useful. Um, and I think it will be incredibly useful to everyone else who will be listening to this, because I think this will be to reference the ID webinar recording we've been doing so far. So thank you so much for that. Um, I would love to have you, Marcus, in the future to talk about peace because you've done a wonderful chapter in the book you're doing. I don't know when that book will be published, but uh, but I mean, with you, we've been doing only DID related subjects, but I think you, you have an incredibly deep knowledge and understanding about um, how this goes beyond um, just um, the technology, but what the purpose is of what we're trying to do and i think that's what is something that is motivating a lot of people in the community so i will have to do that if we have to be as said and uh, we'll have the iiw up in drummond world might bring marcus along or someone else i don't know whoever has time at the time where he will give a full update so you don't have to travel to san francisco ideally you should go to san francisco but if you cannot go uh, you will be able to benefit as you're benefiting this time and knowing everything that happened in Japan in just two hours. 
which is really great. Um, grateful to, for that. Um, we will be doing more of these um, DID reports um, with Drummond and, and Gas and Marcus, hopefully. So this has been the first one. And as the sessions happen in the future, um, that we will repeat them. Um, yeah, and, and I think that's about it. Um, Marcus or Drummond, is there anything else you would like to share or final thought that you would like to, 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 to um, share with everyone here? No, I, I just want to uh, thank, I want to in particular thank everyone that, uh, um, you know, all the members of this new working group, uh, the chairs especially, Dan Burnett and, and uh, Brett uh, Zendel, uh, for you know, for all the work they've done in putting this together. Again, we, we're presenting here the work of a great number of people that are participating in the working group or contributing at uh, the Credentials Community Group, and then of course through IW and uh, Rebooting Web of Trust and, and my data. These are the conferences. So we're just you know we're reporters on on what's happening in a much larger community. Uh, it's just a real pleasure to do it, and I thank Marcus for staying up super extra late or super early, whatever it is in Korea right now. That's right. I, I wanted to say basically the, the same thing. Right, the working group is is officially starting now. Uh, but we, we should acknowledge all the work that has happened so far, in the, in, especially in the Creations Community Group. Internet Identity Workshop, Rebooting, uh, Web of Trust, many, many people have spent uh, much time uh, to, to get to that point. Good, and we look Wonderful. forward to doing future DID reports. Uh, we've got a two-year uh, window here, and a lot is going to happen in that in that time. So thank you, Alex. <laughs> and here's why we thought this was going to be sort of a, a short one to uh, <laughs> report on the working group meeting. It's the <laughs> longest SSI meetup so far. Yeah, it has been, but it has been really worth it. Just for everyone else who's still around and who will be listening to this next week, we will have Adam Krasovsky. Um, he's the VP of Technology and Blockchain at Kiva, and some really cool stuff they're doing um, and trying to create a credit bureau for the future using SSI. They're also doing um, the code project in Sierra Leone with the United Nations Development Program. That's happening next Thursday, the 26th. So check it out. If you want to learn about um, more SSI meetup webinars, just check out the Telegram channel, sign up to the newsletter, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, all those things um, where you can get informed. And that's about it. Thank you so much, Raman. Thank you. Marcus, um, and I'm very grateful, and, and thank you in the name of everyone else who, who, who will be able to benefit from this, and have a very good night, both of you, and very good morning to you, Marcus, in Korea. Thanks, Alex. Thanks. Bye.